Well, hello and welcome again to our online Bible study that we call and the theme of our Bible study is Your Kingdom Come. And we're talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. This was the thrust of Jesus' ministry was to preach about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a, a pearl of great price. So all of his parables, his stories, somehow tied in to what the kingdom of God was, was like. And so this is what we are to manifest as his sons and daughters in the kingdom. As we are his children, this is what he's commissioned us to do. Now our subtopic today is tarry. Now that's not a word that we use too much in our English language, but I think that it's a word that we need to, to really focus in on today. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. This is our text for today. And I love the book of Acts. It's just uh, a power-packed book that, that shows how the church was birthed and how the church began to grow and spread throughout the world and how they became world changers. But you have to ask yourself, they just started out with 12 people. It was just a small group of people. But it grew until they said that they, these people were turning the world upside down. So what was the key to bringing just a small group of people for them to then develop and explode or mushroom into becoming a mighty force in the world in which they lived? It was in the Roman Empire and how they were really impacting the whole world at that time going from Israel and then spreading out down to Egypt down to the islands of the sea up into uh, Asia Minor into Turkey and Syria, Iraq then over into Macedonia into Greece and ultimately to Rome I mean to you think, well, this was impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And sometimes we, in our flesh, we want to give up. We say, it's just too hard. It's too difficult. But here is how the book of Acts begins. And so I, I think we really need to study the book of Acts to see how a small group of people they were not perfect and they were discouraged and they were confused and they didn't have a plan of action but here's what it says in the first book O Theophilus I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them, to the apostles, after his suffering by many proofs. Sometimes we say infallible proofs. I mean, without a doubt proofs that he was alive. Appearing to them during 40 days. This is after his resurrection. He appeared to them for 40 days after his death, burial, and resurrection. And what did he talk to them about? He spoke to them about what? The kingdom of God. So your will be done. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Even after his death, and resurrection and his appearances to them in his resurrected body 
What was his subject matter? It was the kingdom of God. You know, Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. That's the smallest seed that you can get. But it grows and develops into a mighty tree. So we should, you know, the Bible says we should not despise small beginnings. So verse 4, and while staying with them for those 40 days, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem. That was the capital of Israel. That's where the temple was. That's where Jesus was crucified and resurrected. He said he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait, or the word would be tarry, for the promise of the Father. So we have to say, well, what was that promise? Which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So what were they to wait for? They were to wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, I know that I know that I know when I gave my life to the Lord that there was an encounter that I had with the Lord. He transformed my life. He infused me. He filled me with his love, his joy, his peace. So we think about water baptism, and yes, Jesus commanded us to do that because it was an outward and visible sign of what was an internal transformation that has happened in our lives. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when, you know, do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, that you're not your own? You've received this from God. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your bodies. The Apostle Paul said to uh, some disciples from Ephesus, he says, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said, well, nobody's told us about it. So no, we haven't received it. We've been baptized in water, but we haven't received the Holy Spirit. Nobody's taught us about that. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is when we're, we're just filled to, you know, the scripture says in Ephesians that we're to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are to be filled with, and that is a continual feeling of the Holy Spirit inside of us. That he deposits a layer of himself within us. We have the Holy Spirit living and dwelling inside of us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And this is what Jesus was telling the disciples to do. To tarry, to wait for the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Now, the author of the book of Acts is the physician and the missionary partner of the Apostle Paul. And his name was Luke. Now, Luke had already written his first book, which was what we call the Gospel of Luke. But the reason he felt compelled to write his gospel account. You see, he was not the first one that wrote the gospel. It's believed that Mark was the first one, and Mark is pretty sketchy in the details. He just says, immediately this happened, and immediately that happened, and he doesn't really fill in the gaps in between what, is, what he's uh, relating to us. Matthew 
wanted to look at it from a Jewish per perspective, but Luke was a Gentile, and he wanted to look at it through the lens of a Roman, of someone that was in the Roman Empire, a Gentile. And so he wanted to, to give, as he said, let's look at what he said in Luke when he, uh, when he began his uh, gospel in the book of Luke. He said, inasmuch as many, many, see there were many gospels that were written, many stories that were written or compiled. Now we only have... Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And John was much later, decades later, than Luke. So when he says, inasmuch many have undertaken to compile a narrative, he's not even including John, who would come much later, decades later. But he's talking about Mark and Matthew, but there were others that wrote an account as well. But he says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. See, Luke was not necessarily an eyewitness of what was going on. But he got his information from eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. He got it from Peter and the other apostles. He was like an investigative reporter who was interviewing all these people and learning the details and looking at the historical background, you know, the political realm as well. So he said, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past. So he was following all this very closely. Like I said, he was interviewing all the eyewitnesses, getting their stories, and putting it, writing it down. And then he says, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. He wanted to write an orderly account. You know, not just, you know, scrambling it around, but, you know, chronologically or giving the, you know, all the background for what was going on. Verse 4, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. He wanted them to know. He wanted to document it. He did his paper, if you will. You know, when, when I was in high school, you know, we had to do these papers and we had to document where, where our sources w came from. You know, so that's what Luke was wanting to make sure that he had, all, you know, all the information and that he, re you know, received his information from all the sources whether it was the historians like Josephus or others, he interviewed and he put it all down in an orderly account. He said in verse 5, For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And I think I, I got that uh, out of context there, but... Anyway, both of his books that Luke wrote was addressed to Theophilus. And there's, you know, debate as to who Theophilus was, but his name means lover of God. So, O oh, most excellent Theophilus, the lover of God. So, he stated in his gospel that he wanted to write an orderly or a systematic or organized account for us. Not one that was put together without any rhyme or reason. You know, it's like you can put, you can have um, all these stories and 
you know, how are they linked together and how do they flow together? He wanted to, to give a very orderly account, you know, and a systematic account of what happened. Not just rambling around from one story to the next, but how do all these fit together and how do you link them together? So in the opening verses of the book of Acts, Luke stressed that his first book dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up into heaven. In other words, when Jesus ascended into heaven, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. So the first book dealt with all that Jesus began to teach. So that implies that Jesus didn't finish his work when uh, the book of Luke closes. That it was just a continuing process. That, as he said, for 40 days, Jesus was appearing to the disciples. And Paul says that there were up to 500 people at one time that had seen Jesus, the resurrected Lord. 500 people. That's a lot of people that saw the resurrected Lord. Now, he gave certain commands to the apostles because, look, they were clueless. They didn't know what to do. Jesus had always been their leader, the one that told them, we're going here, we're going to do this. I'm going to preach these sermons. You've got to feed the multitudes. He, was, he says, we're going to go to the other side. Get in the boat. Let's go. He was the one that was telling them where they were to go, what they were to do. And now he's in and out in his resurrected body appearing to them. But they're still trying to piece all this together and say, what do we do from here? What am I supposed to do? You know? So in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, here's what Jesus, one of those commands that he told the apostles. He said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. What's that promise? The prom promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with Power from on high. And then in, Luke, in Matthew's gospel, he ends his gospel by saying that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Disciples, not just converts. Those who have been taught and trained and understand the doctrines that Jesus gave to them so grounding them and establish them, establishing them in the faith baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit so there was the water baptism teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you so our job is to teach people what Jesus taught them. And he says, Behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Well, looking at Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, still looking at what he commanded them, he said, While staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem. This is during those 40 days, right? But to wait for the promise of the Father which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You know, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon the prophets like Elijah and some of the others, like uh, Moses. And they could do mighty miracles whenever the Holy Spirit came upon them. Even King Saul, when the Holy Spirit came upon him, he was able to do uh, great things. 
But, like I said, the Holy Spirit did not indwell them. It came upon them from time to time. Elisha, it said that he would use have people play musical instruments so that he could get in the spirit, so to speak, and know what he was supposed to do. He had to be in the right frame of mind <laughs> for the Holy Spirit to come upon them. But here, he's saying that you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You'll not have this external water to cleanse you and to identify you with my death, burial, and resurrection and, and for repentance. But you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So it's a water, the living water flowing inside of you. That's what he's talking about. So the key instruction that he gave his apostles was tarry, tarry, or wait for the promise of the Father, for you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You know, they hadn't been baptized until the day of Pentecost. That was 50 days after his crucifixion. 50 days on the day of Pentecost. That's when they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. And it said it was like a mighty rushing wind that went through that upper room and there were tongues of fire that, ap that appeared over them and they began to speak in tongues. You know, they were speaking the heavenly language. They were speaking tongues that they hadn't learned in school. The Holy Spirit took possession of them. And it was like a fire burning inside of him. Think of the two uh, disciples that were on the road to Emmaus after his resurrection. And they were trying to understand what has happened here. And Jesus comes along and starts talking to them. And opening up to them the scriptures and revealing to them, here's the scripture and here's what happened. Here's how I fulfilled it. And then when Jesus left those two disciples, they said, did not our hearts burn within us? So there's a burning of the Holy Spirit. I don't know how to describe it. But it's a burning inside of you. A hungering and a thirst. And it's that living water that Jesus talked to the woman at the well about. But he told them to tarry and wait for that promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Are you just going through the motions? Are you trying to do it in your own efforts? Too often, we're so eager to do something. To carry on a mission, for example. Oh, we've got to do this great work. We've got to, you know, Jesus said we're to do this and that and the other. No, he said, he said for us to tarry. He said for us to wait. That's hard for us to wait or tarry. We think, well, we've got our own ideas. But he said we are to intentionally wait or tarry for the baptism of the Holy Spirit before doing anything. Well, you think that there should have been an urgency. Shouldn't they have just gone out immediately and proclaimed the gospel? No. First things first. They had to tarry. They had to wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit before they did anything. See, they were scared. And they were clueless. And they were confused. But it changed when they had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So for us, and I've seen it so often, and it really, I know it distresses me. I, I would say that it really distresses the Lord. You know, we form our committees and teams, and we seek to develop our own man-made plans or ideas. We bring in consultants who are supposedly experts to give us advice. But the last thing that we do is tarry or wait expectantly and prayerfully for the Holy Spirit to speak or move upon us. We don't wait. 
You know, we think that we can do it in our own strength, our own ability. We can't. Doing what Jesus has commanded us to do is hard if we try to do it ourselves. It's almost impossible if we try to do it ourselves. Now, the word tarry, what does that mean? In the original language, here's what it means. It means to sit down or to settle, to hover or dwell. The psalmist said, be still and know that I am God. The word still means to slacken, to forsake, or let alone. You know, that's one of the lessons that I think that the Lord has tried to teach me is that I am, you know, I am so, um, well, I have been athletic, you know, as I grew up and I played basketball. And in sports, you know, you're always, there's always activity. You're always on the move. You're doing something. You're using your body, you know, in, in some form or fashion. But to be still, to let go, to forsake, to slacken, to let alone, wow, that's hard for me to do. It's hard for me to sit still. It's hard for me to dwell or hover, to be still. I think I need to be doing something. I'm a doer. But God says we're human beings, not human doers. That he loves us even if we're still and we're not doing anything. We think, well, we've got to have God's approval, so we need to be, we're performance driven is what I'm trying to say. And that's not the way that God is. He says, just be still. Let it go. To me, to me, it means that we have to empty ourselves. And we have to let go of our own vain thinking and the efforts. And we have to open ourselves up to what the Lord is saying, doing, or teaching us. Remember what Jesus said? He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I'm meek and lowly in heart and you will find rest, rest for your souls. We think, well, we're on a mission. We've got to do, you know, we've got to do the Lord's work. And he says, you'll find rest for your souls. Rest? I thought you wanted to, us to do so there's a balance. I'm not trying to get us too far off the pendulum one way or the other. You know, we can go too far on the left or too far on the right. We've got to find a balance. But we have to realize that first, we need to find that rest for our souls. If we're agitated, if we're stressed out, that's not God's plan. Jesus said, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's similar to floating on the water. Now, I never learned this. I was never around the water much. I never had any swimming lessons. So I never, and, and as a result, uh, you know, I had no one to teach me. I had a fear of the water. But here's the thing, the more you strive and struggle and put forth effort, the more danger you're in. You know, those that have capsized out of a boat or something, if they're struggling and they're thrashing their arms and legs, it's hard for anyone to rescue them. It's when they let go and trust that someone is rescuing them. When you let go, stop your striving and struggling. The more you strive and struggle, the more effort you put into something, the more danger you're in. 
But the more you let go and relax, it's easier to be, uh, to stay afloat. The easier it becomes to stay afloat. You have to let go. So when we're stressed out, when we're wring, wringing our hands, when we're worrying or fretting about what we're going to do about a situation, well, you're not the one that's going to solve it. The more you wear, worry and stress out and fret about it, the bigger the problem grows. But when we learn the secret of letting go and letting God, say, God, this is yours. I can't change the circumstances. I can't change who I am. I can't change what's happening around me. So I'm just going to let go and let you have your way. That's when miracles can happen. An example. Andrew Womack, who is the president and fam uh, founder of Karis Bible College in Colorado, he grew up in Texas, I believe, but, you know, and he had small churches to begin with, but he had an, a personal encounter with God as a young person. And he was drafted and went into Vietnam. But he said, you know, he was a chaplain's assistant. And he volunteered to stay at the barracks while the others went out. And so he said he had hours upon hours that he had nothing to do. So he just read the Bible continuously, like for 15 hours a day. And he said, I went in as a Baptist. When I came out, I wasn't. Because he read what the Word of God said. And he began to do what the Word of God said to do. But anyway, long story short, he, he talked about how the Lord began to speak to him. Now, he's been in ministry for 50 years. But the Lord began to speak to him, oh, around 2000 or something. And God was saying that he was limiting the Lord by his small thinking. Now, Andrew says, I never wanted to build a Bible college. He had seen Bible colleges, and he saw people who, who went into those Bible colleges and how they came out of it. And he said, I didn't want a Bible college because, you know, it was all head knowledge. It was all, you know, well, it wasn't really what it needed to be. And so he didn't want to be a part of that. And... You know, having a worldwide ministry on radio, television, and internet, and social media that he has today. But, you know, building a Bible college, uh, it, it started small, and then it began to grow and expand. And as more and more people came, thousands now that are part of it, he had to build facilities. He found some property up there, beautiful place right across from Pikes Peak in Colorado in the mountains. Beautiful location that the owner, before he died, said that he wanted a ministry that would reach the world with the gospel to be there. And Andrew didn't know that when he got the property. But he had to build buildings to have classrooms and conference rooms and auditoriums to have people come and you know he had to have places for his staff to work and he had places for the teachers and so he had to build buildings and you know all that his ministry entails because he gives out a lot of books and CDs and teaching materials and he has you know a lot of resources on the internet so he had to build a lot of buildings and, and up in the mountains there in Colorado where it snows a lot, he had to build a parking garage. Now, that's where he's had trouble raising funds, but in the last decade, last seven years or so, he spent $120 million dollars which means, and, and then he's um, with the parking garage, didn't work out the way that he wanted it to, and 
he made some mistakes there but he says just to keep operating on a day to day basis he has to have seven thousand dollars a day to meet all of his expenses seven thousand dollars a day and he says you know if his partners those that donate to his ministry he says if they don't support me there's no way that he has the resources to repay all his debt and he's had his CFO come to him and say look we're down to the wire if we don't get money in within a few hours we're going to have to close down the ministry and Andrew would respond and say well at least we have a few hours left for God to do a miracle and throughout the years he's had to have those miracles just to survive but he says that he doesn't lose sleep over it he knows he's made mistakes along the way he hasn't done things perfectly he says God knew he, that he wasn't a perfect vessel when he called him but he says if the Lord wants this and wants him to have this ministry then he will provide whatever's necessary. So he says, I'm content either way. He's 70 years old now. He says, I'm not trying to build, build a legacy for myself. Just trying to be obedient to what the Lord wants him to do. But it's been in those hard times that he has learned to worship and praise the Lord and give him thanks for his goodness and just to rest in his presence. You know, he's got a trail there in the mountains of Colorado. And he'll just walk those trails. And he'll just praise the Lord. And worship him. And he'll speak in tongues. And he says the Lord will uh, then just give him a peace about something. Or, or give him a word. But that's the secret. Just tarry. Just wait. Worship the Lord. You know? So there's two powerful spiritual weapons that we can learn from this lesson. Is number one, tarrying. To tarry. To sit still. To be at rest. Not wringing your hands or being stressed out. You know, if any time that you feel stress coming over you and you're worried and anxious and what am I going to do? What is going to happen? What you need to do, what you're trying to do is saying that you're trying to do it in your own strength and your own effort. You just need to go to Jesus. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. You need to tarry. You need to be still. And know that I am God. Just wait. Wait for the Holy Spirit to move, speak, or, or do something in and through you. And then the second part of that is worshiping and praising God in the midst of life's most difficult struggles. That's part of letting go. That's part of expressing our faith in the Lord. I can't do it. <laughs> if you... If you're looking to me, Lord, you've got the wrong person. Again, if we're stressed out, anxious, wringing our hands, fretting, then there's something wrong. That we're trying to do it in our own efforts. And that'll never work. We need to let go and let God. So if we can learn these lessons well... We'll be able to see great things that the Lord can do in and through us and also find burden-free rest for our souls in those otherwise stressful situations. What are you being stressed out about? What are you worrying and fretting over? Have you let, have you let go, released it to God? And just stay in his presence, singing, making melody in your heart, 
speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. If you're worried and stressed out, start singing. Start praising the Lord. Start reciting the psalms, speaking them to yourself and to others. Let go. Learn how to float. Learn how to trust God. Learn how to be open and allow the Holy Spirit to come in and keep us afloat. We can't do it alone. <laughs> this, what Jesus has called us to do, he says you can't do it by yourself. That's why I'm sending you the Holy Spirit who will be with you forever. We need the Holy Spirit. Invite Him into your life and into your heart today if you're not living a stress-free life, a burden-free life. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Tarry in Jerusalem. You don't know what to do. You don't know how to do it. You don't know how to go into all the world and preach the gospel. To make disciples of all nations. You don't know how to do it. But if you'll come to me, if you'll tarry in my presence, then you give me an opportunity to speak to you, to teach you, to indwell you, to empower you. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Oh, Holy Spirit, come. Come and dwell inside of each one. Let your will be done. <laughs>